Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Learning Salon. We are very excited today to host uh, Fiery Cushman from Harvard to talk to us about punishment as communication. Um, before we do a little bit of introduction, let me remind everyone that the Learning Salon is a weekly forum or now bi-weekly forum on the intersections, bridges, and contentions between uh, biological and artificial learning. We are a very interdisciplinary community. So we have folks from um, neuroscience, computer science, philosophy, psychology, uh, linguistics, and uh, other disciplines, depending on which week we are. And we have people from all walks of academia and research. Some folks are from industry research, like myself. Some folks are from academia. And we want to make sure that everyone uh, can participate. So don't think that your question is um, too stupid. If you're uh, not a, an expert in a field, make sure to ask your question as long as it's, you know, um, respectful, as long as it's generative, as long as it's in the spirit of discussion. Uh, there is an ask a question area below. Please uh, write your questions there and vote on each other's question as usual. If you have any questions during the talk uh, that are clarification things and it's um, impeding your understanding, definitely put it in the chat so somebody can address it. Or if you want to add some link or ask for a link, um, make sure to be very respectful uh, of the conversations. And next to your question, let me know if you want to, uh, if you want us to ask for you or if you would like to appear online. If you choose to appear on camera, your question is more likely to be asked, especially if you're not in the early questions. Um, again, um, this is a forum where we are, you know, a little bit like a community. It's been going on for one and a half years. So I want to thank everyone. And I want to thank uh, Worldwide Neuro for hosting us. I also want to say, we usually say something about significant social events that have happened recently. It just so happens that we have a Harvard professor and there's been some you know, unfortunate news from Harvard in the past week. So if that has been challenging for some of you, just remember that there are also uh, many uh, folks at Harvard that work ethically and actually work on ethical questions. Um, and if you have anything that you'd like to share with everybody else, feel free to uh, leave it in the chat. So we usually do, um, so John, you just sent me a message that your video, we see you and you're, Great. You're muted. You're muted. So I'm going to unmute you. I, I only see myself. I don't see either uh, of you. We see you. So I'm not sure how to fix that. One possibility is that you can restart your Chrome, but your quality is great. You're the best looking of us three anyway. Well, let me just, just try again. <laughs> no, thank you. You know, for a moment there, I almost believed you. <laughs> um, anyway, um, <laughs> I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm going to just reboot it. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Before John <laughs> comes back, I, I'll just say something about Fiery and why he would be a fantastic uh, salon guest. And we we're very lucky that he had the time. Um, one of the things that I really like about FIRE's research is that not only does it combine um, researching about normative issues, about uh, ethics, and uh, about various kinds of, um, I don't want to say intuitive decision making, but I want to say something aligned that line um, that sometimes is left out of a, a kind of a logic approaches to reasoning. And also the other thing is that he uses modeling and the lab uses modeling. And um, I think that that is something in social psychology that there is a lot of space for it now. And I've really appreciated over the past couple of years, uh, kind of an increase in people using modeling in social psychology and especially um, uh, using reinforcement learning in this case. Uh, a lot of folks at uh, Fiery's lab are excellent uh, researchers, uh, both past and present. You definitely should take a look at his lab. We will drop a link in the chat. And um, I think you even have like developmental psychologists in your lab who have a modeling approach, which is particularly exciting because even recently we've been discussing at Microsoft Research that we would like to 
um, get a, a talk with developmental psychologists to figure out the tests for different stages of development in kids and design similar for robots who are doing a particular thing. So uh, I think that uh, the future of combination of developmental work and reinforcement learning is going to be very productive as well. So I was very excited uh, to follow the work of your lab over the years in their diverse set of work, all of which somewhat relates to how we relate and regard each other and reinforcement learning, which is fantastic topics. With that, um, is there any uh, fun fact about you that we should know? My musical instruments, art? Oh, music, no. I well, I, I, over, just over the last year, I've been trying to learn to play the piano. So I'm, I'm an inept uh, beginner piano player. That'll be my fun fact. Um, but thank you so much for that introduction. And it's a, it, it, it's very touching to hear that from you because um, I, probably many people in the audience know this, but Ida has been just at the forefront for years and has been a model to folks in my lab of using computational methods to address questions of real social and ethical importance. Um, and so, uh, so it's, it's kind of you to, to, have, to have given that introduction. Um, yeah, so I, you know, I'm in the psychology department and I run a research lab um, where we're trying to understand uh, morality. But the lab has two parts. There's a larger group of people in the lab who study morality. And a lot of them have background in philosophy, although we're not philosophers. We're not trying to answer what is actually right and wrong. We're just trying to understand how the human mind makes judgments about right and wrong. And sometimes we're trying to figure out how one could build uh, artificial systems that would do the same. But there's this other smaller group of people in my lab who study computational um, models of decision making and reasoning. And it's uh, purposeful, of course, that we bring those two groups together in the lab. What we're trying to do is to um, find deep and interesting connections between the very powerful models of decision making um, that have gained traction in the last 15, 20 years in the field that handle relatively simple choices. You know, complex enough, but simple relative to ethical dilemmas. And we're asking, can we use those tools to understand how people think about moral decisions as well? It is incredibly challenging and we usually feel like we're failing. Like we're, we're, not, we're not making those connections as well as we would like to be able to. But I wanna just kind of spin out for you over the last, I'll talk about research that started now about 10 or 12 years ago. Um, one of the areas in which we're starting to see maybe a hint of convergence. But I hope that part of maybe the biggest thing that you'll take away from what I want to say is the challenge and the excitement of that challenge. Um, and and I, I hope that you'll apply a critical eye your, yourselves thinking when you try to capture an everyday part of our lives like punishment, bring it into a lab and turn it into an experiment and then try to write down a model, a mathematical model of what's happening. At the end of the day, have you been true to the originating phenomenon, you know, the thing in the world that you are trying to explain? So many years ago as a graduate student, as I started to work on punishment, one of the first things that I was trying to understand was this mystery that comes out of the philosophy literature called moral luck. And what moral luck refers to is, among other things, the idea that we'll sometimes punish people in a way that just depends on luck. So here's a classic example. Um, you know, two people are driving uh, home after sharing some beers together at a bar. They're in, each in their own car. They both fall asleep at the wheel. They both run off the road. One of them uh, runs into a tree. So they're, they're asleep at the wheel. They don't know what they're running into. They hit a tree, fender bender. You know, if this is their first offense in many jurisdictions in the U.S., they could expect fine, you know, maybe a thousand dollars, perhaps a point off their license for, for driving under the influence. The other person on their way home, they also fall asleep at the wheel, run off the road, run into a person and kill them. And in the most jurisdictions in the United States, you could expect years in prison. Um, so a vastly more punitive response, in this case coming from the criminal justice system, um, for identical behavior, but based on the accident, of uh, you know who happened to or what happened to be in front of you when your car went out of control. So we were trying to understand: is this just a quirk of the criminal justice system, or do do ordinary people make moral judgments like this and kind of bring it under experimental control? And so we designed an experiment in which uh, we called it two-player darts. 
So imagine that Ida and I were playing this. Um, Ida's going to be throwing darts at a board. And the tricky thing is she doesn't know how it's scored. She doesn't know which spots on the board are good or bad. I know that. And moreover, where Ida hits on the board affects my score. And what I'm allowed to do is punish and reward Ida to try to change her behavior. So like the obvious thing to think is, well, if Ida hits a good target, then I should reward her. And if she hits a bad target, I should punish her. And she won't be exactly sure what the scoring scheme is. But over time, she'll figure out how to do the things that profit both of us, right? But here's the tricky thing. We put people far enough away from the board that they were often making mistakes, you know, aiming for one target and hitting another. And we came up with a little trick that I won't describe here, but that made them honestly report what they were aiming for, basically calling their shots. Okay. So what are we going to do if Ida says, oh, I'm aiming for spot 17, which is going to earn me a lot of money. But then accidentally, she hit spot 12, which costs me a lot of money. How should I respond to that? Should I respond by rewarding her for trying to hit something that would have earned money? So that would be punishment based on intention. Or should I instead punish her for hitting something that actually hurt me? And there were two big findings of this study. The first finding is, in fact, people in my position tended to reward and punish based on the outcome, not the intention. They paid attention to what got hit, not what Ida was aiming for. So that actually fits what we see in the criminal justice system. Accidental outcomes, do you hit a tree or do you hit a person, have a big impact on whether you're going to get rewarded or punished. The other key thing that came out of this study is that we found that um, if I was actually an experimenter, unbeknownst to Ida, she thinks I'm just a regular person, and I'm manipulating things so that I either always in reward, reward and punish her for her intentions, or I always reward and punish her for the outcomes, she'll learn better if I reward and punish outcomes, the thing that people naturally do. And we thought that was interesting because it suggested that maybe part of the reason why we do reward and punish accidental outcomes is because it's an effective way of communicating to other people, a, a more effective way of teaching them what pattern of behavior we we expect from them. There was another thing that we didn't actually mention in the write-up of this uh, study at all, but that really stuck with me for several years after, which is that in the way that we designed the experiment, people who were in my position, they had uh, the option to reward or punish people a dollar at a time. And these were undergraduates um, and they were making repeated decisions. So, you know, over the course of the experiment, the stakes could be 15 or $20, which to a typical undergraduate is, is non-trivial uh, stakes. And people were asking us, do I have to reward and punish a dollar or could I just reward or punish one cent? They were especially eager to punish exactly one cent, the minimum possible amount. And that again, seemed to be best explained if you thought that they weren't viewing the punishment principally as a way of creating a big incentive for Ida. They were using it as a method of communication. So presumably Ida doesn't care whether she's one cent richer or one cent poorer. We're not doing a good job of incentivizing her behavior by changing one cent at a time. But, you know, if I say, oh, I'm going to dock you exactly one cent, I am sending a message to her about, hey, well, the thing that you just did is something that I don't want you to do. And so for, you know, I went through the rest of my, my graduate training and wrote various papers, but in the back of my mind had wanted to find some way to enrich this idea that, um, although naively you might think the main point of punishing somebody is to set up an incentive, you know, to incentivize them to do good things or not to do bad things, that may be just as important. I mean, this isn't mutually exclusive, but another important thing that could be going on is that we're just using the punishment as a way of talking, as a way of sending a message or a communication. And that is an idea that one sees in, in the legal literature and in the philosophy literature. It's an idea often called expressivism, but there hadn't been, it, the idea is like you're expressing something through your punishments, right? But that, that's an idea that hadn't been pursued much in psychological research. So I got my first um, job, my first faculty job you know, as a professor starting a new lab at Brown University, I was incredibly lucky that at the same time that I started at Brown, 
there was a new um, hire in their computer science department, a guy named Michael Littman, who for many years had been studying uh, machine learning and reinforcement learning, just a real uh, leader in, in, in that field. And um, Michael and I were talking about reward and punishment, and he shared an observation from the literature in computer science and machine learning that, um, that got the two of us thinking. What he said was that um, although there'd been a huge amount of progress in computer science, getting artificial intelligence systems to learn from reward and punishment, and just to give you an example of what I mean, like all the advances that you might've heard about in um, machines being able to play games like chess or Go, build on this basic method. You, you make checkmate rewarding, and then through experience, uh, the artificial intelligence system learns to play chess better and better and better, very, very successfully. Despite all of that, if you took the state-of-the-art methods and you said, um, instead of it being checkmate that's going to be rewarding and you know losing the game is going to be punishing, I'm going to have a human reward and punish you machine. Okay, So you're going to play chess and you're going to figure out how to play it well because a smart human is going to be rewarding and punishing you. Or if it's not chess, maybe it's some much simpler task. The machines totally failed. And what that suggested to the computer scientists was that the machines were doing a perfectly good job of trying to respond to human incentives, but humans must be doing something that's not well explained as just setting up an incentive scheme, which if you maximize on it, results in good behavior. I know that's super, super abstract, but we had a student who was working with us, a guy named Mark Ho, who has since gone on to amazing things. Um, and uh, this was one of Mark's very first experiments. You're gonna see this very abstract idea play out in a concrete way. And this experiment that Mark came, came up with has, has really shaped my thinking uh, in big way. So let me see if I can share my screen here. And whoops, that's not what I want to share. I want to share that. Okay, there we go. Ida, give me a thumbs up um, if you uh, are seeing that well. Okay. So, uh, and how about my mouse? Can you see my mouse? Ida? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. So in this experiment, you're going to um, suppose that, that you're a participant. We say, I've got this little dog here. And uh, the dog's a smart dog. He can learn. And you can use rewards and punishments to train him. Here's your rewards and punishments. If you click over here, you're giving him a little, you know, gentle zap. Here, you're just talking sternly to him. And then you can give him rewards, like you can give him dog treats. And here's what we need the dog to do. We need the dog to learn that it's supposed to walk up the path when it gets home and go in the door, but not walk on the flowers. Okay, that's all. So the dog starts you know, behaving in this environment and the people are clicking on the rewards and punishments to try to train the dog. So I want to show you the rewards and punishments on average that ordinary human beings assign here. So every blue arrow that you see, that's an action which, if the dog performs that action, on average, people reward the dog. And the longer the arrow is, the greater the average rewards are. Okay. And then you see all those red arrows. Those are actions which, if the dog performs them, on average, people punish the dog. It looks pretty natural. I mean, what are people doing? They're basically saying, well, any action you take that puts you on the path gets reward. And if you move the correct direction on the path, that's what gets you the most reward. And you go to the goal. Now, you would think that if you took state-of-the-art machine learning algorithms, the kind that can beat the world experts in chess and go, and you provided them with this feedback, this is what humans do, these rewards and punishments, surely they would learn to walk on the path, not on the flowers, and get to the door. In fact, that is not at all what they do. What they would do is run in infinite circles. And I want to show you why. Okay, so tally up the points that I'm making if I move up here. I get some blue, I get some blue, I get some blue. Now, if I go in the door, game's over. But what if I'm willing to take a little bit of red to come back to the beginning again? Ah, in that case, I get to rinse and repeat and keep accruing more and more and more reward. In fact, there's some locations here where I could just jump back and forth 
and never get punished. And so I just move in little circles, getting reward, 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 reward. So these are called positive feedback loops, and they've been characterized in the machine learning literature before. It was known that when you design systems of reward and punishment, you have to avoid these things. Because a pure reward maximizer is always going to find them and start to exploit them. Now, what's interesting here, the whole point of this is that Although our best state-of-the-art AI will exploit these rewards, these little loops, that is not what a human would be likely to do. If you rewarded and punished a human the way that we see people are doing here, they would presumably learn exactly the point. And so then the question arises, well, how? What if, if, if humans aren't responding to the rewards and punishments by trying to maximize the rewards and minimize the punishments, what the heck is the thing that they are doing that would allow them to solve this problem? And Mark's original idea, which I think is on the right track, his original idea is that basically the rewards and punishments are a map. And the map tells you which are the good actions and which are the bad actions. And so you're not trying to maximize reward, you're trying to listen for the signal in the reward. You're trying to listen for the, the message, there's a map, there's a gradient, if you follow it, that's the goal. That's the thing I'm trying to, to sort of express to you. Okay, I'm gonna um, stop my screen sharing and Come back. All right. So that was an experiment that Mark did. And for a couple of years, I thought that that was really uh, the right model. And, and, Mar and I should say, Mark formalized the model. He, you know, he had a nice mathematical treatment of what it would mean for a human not to be maximizing reward, but instead to be kind of learning the map of like, oh, these are the permissible actions. And this is the hill, the trail of breadcrumbs, the ever increasing rewards that are the kind of signal to me of what the goal of this environment uh, is, how it should be interpreted. Then I had a student, Arunima Sarin, she's um, uh, still in my lab currently, we'll be wrapping up her, her PhD next year. And she pushed the model one step further. And the easiest way to explain it will be for me to jump right into her killer example. But this is just one example. She's done a lot of experiments with, with a lot of uh, different cases. W once you hear the example, you'll see why even Mark's more sophisticated map drawn model isn't quite enough to explain how humans learn from punishment. So Arunima says, imagine that there's a group of roommates, okay? And these roommates, uh, they, they share an apartment. One of them, Alice, has not been doing the dishes at all. And the other roommates get together. They've tried talking to her about this, you know, but they're not making any progress. And they hatch the following plan. They're going to go to Walgreens. They're going to buy a brand new bottle of dish soap, a brand new sponge, and some wrapping paper and ribbon. They're going to wrap up this brand new dish soap and sponge beautifully, tie a bow on it, write a little card that says, love your roommates. And they're going to leave it on her pillow as a gift. So then we ask people, a few questions such as, um, how do you think Alice is gonna feel when she gets the gift? And what people tend to say is she's gonna feel terrible and embarrassed. We ask them, do you think there's gonna be any change in Alice's behavior after she receives this gift? And people tend to say, yeah, we think she's gonna start to do the dishes more often. And we say, how would you describe that gift? Would you describe it as a reward or a punishment? And people say, I would describe it as a punishment. So that's really interesting. On the one hand, it's totally intuitive. Like this is a very passive aggressive snarky way of dealing with your roommate, but it makes sense. Yeah, that's kind of a social sanction. And yet obviously at a literal level, if we were thinking in terms of reinforcement, it is the exact opposite of a punishment. I mean, it might not be the best gift ever, but it certainly is not imposing any literal immediate cost on Alice. One might say that it's threatening an eventual cost, or one might certainly say that it's intended to communicate this pleasure. But if we just look strictly at the behavior performed, it's one of gifting, not one of punishing. And so you can see, and I'm, maybe I'll just share my screen one more time to try to make this clear, how this is not really gonna um, work on Mark's model 
according to which you follow the trail of breadcrumbs of reward in order to learn what the goal is. Because the literal trail of breadcrumbs in this case would be, oh, I haven't been doing dishes. And now my roommates are giving me a little gift. <laughs> they must love my behavior. Clearly the path I'm on is the correct path. So uh, this naturally led to the question, what is gonna be the kind of computational model that would uh, be able to capture um, this form of kind of snarky passive aggressive punishment? And Arunima's insight, and, and, uh, and Mark was instrumental in this as well, uh, was to actually borrow some computational methods that have been developed recently in the study of language, and in particular in the study of figurative language, like irony. So think about, for instance, uh, if there was a terrible storm outside, and I said to my wife, oh my gosh, Julie, don't you just love this weather? So there's a sense in which it's kind of like the snarky gift, right? I'm saying something which is literally, this weather is nice, but the way, of course, that it's intended to be interpreted is this weather is not nice and I don't like it. Just like the gift is literally a positive piece of feedback, a positive thing, but it's intended to be interpreted as a negative thing. And in these recent um, models of language, uh, and, and these were um, initiated by uh, Michael Frank and Noah Goodman at Stanford University, the so-called Rational Speech Act model, the way that they think about how it is that we're able to understand irony and other sorts of uh, figurative speech is through a process of recursive mentalizing. So basically, um, you know, well, I know that generally he doesn't like this weather and there's two things that he could be trying to express here. One is that he does this time and the other is he doesn't, but he's also being ironic. So it's a kind of a reasoning process that requires both the speaker and the listener to have a mental model of the other's communicative intent and ability to interpret communicative intent. And so this kind of brings you up to where we are right now. This, this winter, we've been trying to build a formal model that has that same flavor of a speaker and a listener who are not just operating at a literal level, but are holding a representation of the other's mind and then doing inference, doing reasoning about the likely communicative intent, trying to have a kind of meeting of the minds to use those formal methods to also understand this case of figurative punishment that Arunima has discovered, which we think and we hope, even though it's unusual, it's not the typical way in which you would punish a person, might be teaching us something deep and important about how punishment works in humans. N namely, that, you know, contrary to the kind of Skinnerian behaviorist view, that, um, when humans reward and punish each other, they're setting up rewards and punishments. And if you maximize the rewards and minimize the punishments, that's the goal. That instead, these rewards and punishments are really more like language. They're a way that we're trying to signal to each other, um, what do I want you to do? Uh, and, and what are relevant expectations? So that's a little snapshot of the kind of work uh, that we do, the, the challenge of trying to build formal models and have laboratory experiments that do justice to the phenomenon out there. Um, and I'll be excited to hear uh, folks' questions and feedback. Thank you so much. Um, there is a delay, so people's uh, people are going to start clapping <laughs> a little further. Um, in the future, there is a lack here. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, I agree with Ayuna, who was saying that they are very um, mesmerized by your storytelling skills. Um, you're very, uh, you presented things very well. And I think it's the first time that we've had a person that only presented slides like um, once or twice and you just went without the slides. So that was a very kind of old school salon style approach. And I really appreciated it. Um, ooh, Melanie's here. Melanie, I wonder whether we can bring you here. If you have a hard deadline, let us know. Uh, so I would love to open the kind of the questions uh, by asking John to ask his questions since we have him in high quality right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, you know, um, listening to you, um, you, you know, I actually was lucky, um, 
you know, moral luck, you know, you know, Bernard Williams wrote that wonderful monograph on moral luck. And I was lucky enough to actually sit on a, on a seminar with him a few times. He wasn't really talking about moral luck, but, you know, it was a very interesting issue. And I think it's really fascinating, you know, how you started. Um, you know, Ida and I, I think in the last year and a half, other than arguing about the uselessness of my Wi-Fi, we've also sort of had um, discussions about this divide between what I've tried to call sort of procedural ways of making something look like it's making moral decisions by versus what you've just discussed, which is this sort of inference on what do they want me to think that they're thinking and this sort of recursive issue. Um, and the way I've always interpreted all this in this particular example of yours is you started by saying, well, if it's just reward and punishment, then you can get into these stupid little loops where you never get to the goal. And then you've got this other slightly procedural way of making you understand the goal by seeing this incremental hill towards the goal. So there you can, and then you go, well, even that's not going to work when somebody gets a present, which is actually a bit of irony, hoping for them to. Uh, and, and it seems to me that I, I lose sight of where the ground floor of the argument it's right. In other words, what are the starting assumptions that one can then start formalizing with a computational model? Right. Yeah. What it is seems to me. Question. And and so and the, and the point and the, just to, what, what I mean by that is, if you're just doing something dumb like rewards and punishments or even gradients, you can sort of operate operationalize that, and you never have to talk about what am I thinking that she's thinking that I'm thinking that she's thinking and all that. But once you start getting into that regime of irony and humor, it just seems like you're in a different universe altogether, right? Where the ground floor upon which you'll build your model is the assumption that you've got a theory of mind in the first place, right? So in other words, you've shifted the ground floor from which you do your mathematics. In the case of the beginning, you were doing math on things like scalar rewards and punishments and then you were doing math on gradients and then you start talking about something new which is theory of mind and inference and then from that ground floor you do the math but to me what has always happened in these salons and i would like to ask you is it's the ground floor change that we have to understand not the fact that we can do math on the new ground floor yeah did you see what i'm saying I think I do. Yeah. I so I want to make three comments about this. Um, well, or two comments about this and one comment about Bernard Williams, who has for, since first introduced to him as a teenager, been my favorite moral philosopher. Um, and I'll just throw out there in case folks haven't seen it. If, if you're at all curious, um, when Williams died, Martha Nussbaum wrote a um, uh, wrote an essay about his life uh, and, and achievements. I think it was in the Boston Review or something like that. It, it's stunning and it's a wonderful introduction to William. So if, if that piques anyone's interest who's philosophically inclined. And, and also just uh, and just one last thing about Bernard Williams, just because we're talking about him. Um, if you all, he also wrote a lot of book reviews and essays, the London Review of Books and elsewhere. And it was not just formal philosophy. And if you just want to have a book that every now and then you pick up and just randomly pick an essay and just want to see extreme wit and intelligence applied to almost any topic from opera to the great american novel i don't know fire if you've seen these essays of his but he's just i haven't just a wonderful reviewer as well as a moral philosopher of the highest caliber but i i'm sorry i didn't want to interrupt you but you just got me excited no about no Williams. Yeah. i am I, i'm perennially yeah. excited about bernard williams so thank you for the tip so I want to I want to now turn to the point that you made about the ground floor, and I sort of picked up two different themes from it, and I want to do justice to both of them. So if it sounds like I'm not doing full justice at first, wait, <laughs> and then tell me at the end whether I got got everywhere. So one one question is, when you're doing this type of you know, I thought that you knew that she saw that that type of you know recursive mentalizing. One of the big insights. Um, that we originally learned from the Rational Speech Act model and that Marco in particular has drawn out as we've begun to try to formalize 
uh, this, the sorts of experiments that I was discussing today. That recursive mentalizing needs a literal semantics. That is, it needs a ground floor on which higher order inferences can be drawn. So in the case of language, let's think about figurative speech again. Um, it is ironic when I see a storm outside to say, oh, isn't this wonderful that it's raining? But it would be a complete non sequitur for me to say, you know what I really hate? Ice cream. That's, that's another false statement. But nobody would ever interpret that false statement as an ironic statement. They'd be clueless. They'd have no basis on which to ever connect it to the weather. And when you inspect the formal models and you ask, why is that? Why is a false statement about the weather cluing in your communicative partner that you don't like it, even though you said you, you did, but a false statement about something that isn't the weather doesn't play that role at all. It's because there's shared assumptions about what is the current topic under discussion at the literal level where we're interpreting the statement literally that ground the speaker and the listener in a sufficiently coordinated mental space that then you can build on top of that inferences about, oh, the topic is the weather. So our semantics, our literal semantics has grounded us there. But if the topic is the weather, surely he's being ironic because I know that he actually doesn't like it, okay? Something just like that has to work in the case of punishment. But in this case, ground floors, you know, shared the shared assumption that gets us up and running that sort of um, the, at the literal level. It, it's obviously not ling, it's not language. It's not linguistic semantics. There's no language being used. What it is, is the shared assumption that in this case, the topic under consideration is dishes and shared assumptions about um, the nature of reward and punishment and uh, the, 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 that reward and punishment is capable of changing people's behavior. So you were alluding to this idea that um, before one even asks questions about recursive mentalizing or you know, these higher order inferences, just right off the bat, isn't there a simpler set of things which really would be about maximizing rewards and punishments? And the, the no, answer is not only that. Oh, okay. I wasn't actually saying that. I, I actually wasn't. I was saying that I think that there's a, um, a qualitative divide between the use of reward and punishment that might apply to a dog or a Pac-Man in a game and the meaning-laden semantic version of those notions, which then come into play in situations like, ugh, mm -hmm. it's sunny, we were promised rain. So what I'm saying is that whereas you could probably program and model the two original versions you talked about, you know, and get into trouble like that reward closed loop or discovering that gradient. What I'm saying is that when you moved on to the next set of stuff, it was in a, you were in a different semantic universe. As you know, there's yeah, a lot yeah, of work yeah. that's been done on whether, I, I, when I, when, you know, whether this inference of the kind that you're doing, as you know, many people argue that it's the inferential ability that it, that is behind being able to have language in the first place, not the other way around. Right. Right. So, right, right. so all I'm saying is you're just in a, so you're just in a different universe. So in other words, what I'm asking is why will RL work at all once you're in this semantic, meaning laden, ironic universe? Yes. It's just a different regime. And so that's where reward and punishment become false friends. They can be used in the manner of your initial examples, but then they just take on this other way of using those notions that are subject to, you know, can be subjected to irony and sarcasm and nested yeah. inference. They're just different universes that happen to be sharing the words reward and punishment, but they're just, I don't see how they're ever going to be amenable to the same formalization. Okay, but I guess what I, so in, in part, if you'll recall, there were sort of two points I wanted to make and, and, and maybe the second one will be more satisfying, but to return to the first for just a moment, the thing that I'm saying is 
Um, it turns out that if one wants to be ironic with rewards and punishments, it requires a, a foundational semantics, shared semantics of RL, of reinforcement learning, of reward and punishment. So to say that they're separate universes, I, I resonate with that in, in mm -hmm. the sense that there's a whole set of cognitive mechanisms that are brought to bear in the interpretation of figurative acts, which feel extremely different from the reinforcement learning stuff. But in order to get those to work, those higher order inferences to work, you have to build an inferential apparatus on top of shared assumptions just about the, the low level use of reward and punishment to modify behavior. Let me give you an example that we're currently developing. So I apologize that it, it won't be um, even, even as poorly worked out as my former examples. Um, but we're looking at games of hot and cold. So say there's a number line and I know that 40 is the number that you're supposed to go to and you're just you know, like 23, but the only thing that I can do is reward and punish you. So it's kind of like a game of hot and cold where I'm like warmer, 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 and I'm trying to get you to the right number. How is it that you and I would obviously coordinate on a strategy something like, well, even though 43 is the only important number, I'm going to construct, you know, a smooth gradient or maybe a convex gradient towards the reward that you're going to hill climb. And you're going to realize that that's what I'm doing. And you won't be assuming that all those intermediate things, every time I said warmer, that that meant that it like was literally warmer. There was some intermediate amount of reward. You're going to realize that this is just something that I've set up communicatively for your benefit to efficiently guide you to the optimal point. Well, in order for us to be coordinated in that way, to understand the convention that I'm using to get you where you're supposed to go, we have to have a shared theory of essentially reinforcement learning, a shared theory at the base level of how a naive non-communicative agent would respond to environmental rewards and punishments. But then both of us realize that th that naive theory is something that we're each holding in mind. And so we can draw sharper, higher order inferences that allow us to more quickly find the best spot by, by not just acting like a rat you know, in a Skinner box, but by saying, oh, he's treating me like a rat in a Skinner box. I see where this is going. Let me jump ahead. Okay, I get, I, I, I get, I get, I get that. I get that. But just, to, just so I don't, I get that. But what I'm trying to understand here is, in your first cartoon, you had a dog, if I remember, right? It was mm -hmm. a, a dog in a garden, right? So, mm -hmm. is this kind of ground floor that you're discussing to then do what you just could a dog do it? Okay, awesome question, and I, I, I mean, of course, I, I have no idea. Um, it is notable that punishment is much, much, much more restricted in non-human animals than it is in humans. Um, and what so what you do see a lot of in non-human animals uh, is what you might call like reactive aggression. So, you know, you stole food from me, I swat you, you move into my territory, I bark at you, that kind of stuff. What you tend not to see is anything like you got an F on your report card in November, so I put a lump of coal in your stocking at Christmas which a child, you know, might actually be able to draw the appropriate inferences about what the intended communication is, you know, or even just over a short delay, like um, last week you forgot my anniversary and this week I'm still being a little less communicative than normal around the home, right? So it's so, very human nobody... flavored. It's all very human flavored. You see, everything you're saying is very human flavored. Oh, I know, that's right. So what I'm saying so is, my... so, the, so the ground floor, upon which you I, I'm just what I'm trying to understand is is where does this become a special ground floor upon which you then build but you're not going to assume that this even this first inferential ground floor exists in in non-human animals so what's the difference in other words what well, you just said it so what what is it that outside is what is it outside the rl framework that the human has that you just said even that the dogs are much simpler so where's the difference that makes a difference that your the basing hypothesis your that stories i was on? yeah great 
good. So the, the hypothesis that I was floating, but let me just be clear that we have no evidence for this whatsoever. This is just circumstantial drawn from my impressions in, in, in the background literature. You know, clearly non-human animals are able to reward maximize the way that humans are in environments. So if we just think about reinforcement learning as there's an environment and I'm trying to do better, not worse, dogs can do that. And then the suggestion was that humans take that as a kind of literal level shared assumption between a teacher and a learner and then by engaging in some recursive mentalizing are able to have you know much much more subtle inferences that they draw like the examples that i was giving about cole on christmas that perhaps the reason why we don't observe in non-human animals that type of punishment of an act that occurred a while ago that's very salient but there's no um, spatiotemporal connection that would clue you in, hey, this is why you're getting punished. The reason that we tend not to see that in non-human animals is because they lack the capacity, or at least the facility with which we're able to engage in the recursive mentalizing, and therefore that form of punishment would be fruitless. There's no point in engaging in it because uh, the, you know, the dog couldn't learn from it. But, but if just, and what's the formal framework we need to understand that ability to do that recursive mentalizing? Yeah, maybe, you know what, I, I gave a talk yesterday and I still probably have the slides hanging out on my computer. Um, so it's not going to be full on formal, um, but it's going to be formaler and maybe you'll find it helpful and maybe everyone will enjoy it. Also, formaler should be a word. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's a good word. Yeah. Um, As a reviewer, I can say this should be formaler. <laughs> okay, I'm I'm going to be there in thirty seconds, five seconds, done. Okay, you can see it. Yeah. Yeah. P people are still with me. Okay, I think so this is going to be of our faces. Mm -hmm. Yes, I oh, was uh, yeah. raising my thumb. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Oh, okay. I see. I see. I see. I, I made it go away because I thought the answer was no. Okay. So we're going to, here, we're going to be talking about a somewhat different case where we've worked out the math fully. Uh, and, and this is a paper that, um, that Mark Ho is the lead author on, uh, author also with Joe Osterweil and, and Michael Lippman. Um, and so here, what we're going to be thinking about is I am demonstrating a behavior to you and you're trying to learn by observing it. So for example, um, I am playing Pac-Man and I know that the coins are good and that the ghosts are bad, but you don't know any of that. And so as I play Pac-Man, I'm going to try to teach you the rules of the game, but I can't use any words. All I can do is move around in a way that's going to be illustrative to you. Okay, so over here we have reinforcement learning. So I'm an actor and I'm engaged in some planning process. You know, I understand the rules of the game and I want to win. So those are determining my action. And then you're observing me. Presumably, what you're learning is not just low-level actions, like, oh, I should move left in the hallway. But instead, what you're doing is you're using inference, so Bayes' rule, and this is like classic theory of mind, to understand the hidden beliefs and desires that are structuring my behavior that you're subsequently going to use when you play Pac-Man. So again, you're not learning, oh, always move left down this hall. What you're learning is, oh, Fiery's model is ghosts are scary, coins are good, and let's try to get to the next level as fast as we can. So if I adopt those beliefs and goals myself, then I'll play Pac-Man well. Now we know that non-human animals are able to do a decent job of at least some cases of this level, first order theory of mind, You know, understanding the goals and beliefs that um, explain other people's actions. There's a contentious literature about just how well they're able to do it and how many contexts, but there's decent evidence um, that they can Could you give an things. example? I mean, I mean, is that really? Yeah, I'm just sort of curious. I mean, if there's a reference, because you know, primates fail even the false belief test, right? So yeah. Uh, what, well, what it depends. So, on what are the examples? Yeah. Here, here's. Yeah, I know. I know it's contentious, but it's not. They fall. At, they seem to fall at very early hurdle. It seems to me. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah, and and let let me give you one of my favorite examples that I think shows off competence that's well replicated, but um, probably falls short of a full false belief test for, for subtle reasons. Um, this is an experiment that was done by Jonathan Flambaum, Lori Santos, and, and others about 10 years ago. They were on Cayo Santiago. They were working, that's an island off the coast of Puerto Rico, and there's a thousand free-ranging rhesus macaques. That's a 
primate that's native to the Indian subcontinent, but for research purposes, they're the large um, colony on Cayo Santiago. So what they do is um, uh, they uh, they walk up to um, a macaque and they have two boxes and they're they're translucent. So the mac macaques can see inside and both of the boxes have, have grapes inside of them. And both of the boxes are covered in jingle bells, which of course the macaques have never seen before. But uh, in one of the boxes, the clappers have been removed from all the jingle bells and the experimenter shakes that box and it makes no noise. And in the other box, um, the, uh, the clappers are all present. So the experimenter shakes that box and it makes noise. And then the experimenter puts both boxes down in front of themselves takes a couple of steps backwards and basically is sort of almost as if taunting the macaque, like you're going to try to get the grapes. So macaques are equally likely to go to either of the boxes if the experimenter is facing forward. But as soon as the experimenter turns around, the macaques show a strong preference to go to the silent box. And so that here, the macaques have no experience with jingle bells in particular in the past but they're able to integrate a theory of perceptual access by sound and perceptual access by sight in order to flexibly decide when is a deceptive act going to work and when is there no point in trying that deceptive act right so that gives you just i mean just one small example of the kind of work that suggests to us that um and i think you cannot see my slides anymore is that right or can you still you can see it in we can small. See it. I just unpinned yeah. it because we were our faces were covering the bottom half, so I unpinned it Perfect. so everyone can see fully. Everyone can see it. Perfect. Okay, good. So, um, so maybe yeah, we can bring back the slides to to full size because now what I want to talk about are some things where I think there's relatively weaker evidence. At least as I'm not an expert on primate cognition, but as as far as I'm aware, weaker evidence that that primates can cross this Rubicon. So the next thing that we can imagine is that the actor, this is, remember, what the actor is doing is showing the observer, here's how to play Pac-Man. So the actor, instead of just playing the game, you know, just to win and letting the observer watch, the actor could start to think, oh, well, the observer has a mental model of me playing the game. And the observer is going to be engaged in a little bit of, you know, Bayesian inference, theory of mind. And I, I have goals to teach the observer. I have things I want the observer to understand. So now I have a much more complicated planning problem in which I have the original goal to beat the level and win the game, but I'm also maximizing over this additional goal to teach somebody else how to do it. And that might lead me to make different choices, choices that don't help me win the game, but do a good job of communicating the structure of the game to the learner according to the model that I'm working with. And then on top of that, we can build a learner who understands that the actor is operating with these dual planning problems, a teaching problem and a doing problem, and then does inference uh, over beliefs and goals on that basis. So it's those higher order, uh, sort of higher order levels of, um, of inference that we don't see a great deal of evidence for, at least as far as I'm aware, in non-human animals, and which I would argue are generically the kinds of higher order inferences that are gonna be necessary to explain the full set of data that I showed you about rewards and punishments in humans, therefore potentially explaining yes. why we see much, much more sophisticated and interesting punishment behavior in humans as compared to non-human animals. And, and just to, to, to be very clear about it, there's two things two things that I'm invoking that I think are candidates for absence in non-human animals. One is second and third order mental state inference. But the second is the ability to plan in terms of somebody else's mental states, to have a goal defined not in terms of the environment, but an uh, epistemic goal, for instance, the goal that another person would believe or know something. Now, I don't know. Maybe, I mean, maybe actually, as I think about it, maybe the experiment that I just described of Lori Santos is where indeed the macaque is trying to prevent the human from being in the mental state of realizing that the grapes are being stolen. Maybe that's a counterexample. Um, as you can tell, these are the questions to ask, not the answers I come with. 
uh, John, I, I could talk to you forever. Go. This is so deep, but I'm not gonna. But I'm gonna stop now because there are loads of other people around. Yeah, thank you. I was wondering for a second if you're frozen or if you're out of questions. So I was thinking probably the first. I'm one. not out of questions. I'm 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 mesmerized. I find it really interesting. <laughs> but um, it's great, great stuff. So I think uh, the question, the it's a good time for the set of questions of Melanie and Javier, and we can come back to you, John. And I feel like I would rather ask my question after them because. Uh, they're kind of like uh, setting the stage for mine. So I'm waiting for them to pass me the ball. So, you know. <laughs> um, so Melanie, uh, please go ahead. You had the highest voted question as usual. <laughs> uh, I, I had a couple of comments and a question. So, so the comment is, you know, that I put in the, the chat is um, that, you know, we use these words like goal, reward, punishment, and so on. And I think John already mentioned, you know, he brought this up. And uh, th these terms are so meaningful and so rich to humans in so many ways and are so impoverished in, in things like reinforcement learning and often, you know, mean more to us than they do to the machines that are doing them, you know, the notion of a goal versus a reward and so on. Um, so I'm wondering if you think, if, first of all, is, you know, is there, do we have to make these concepts richer in these reinforcement learning agents in order for them to actually be able to do, behave more intelligently? And also the, the question was, you know, there was this paper from a group at DeepMind recently called Reward is Enough, which you probably saw and, the idea there was that this their kind of re re reward that they use in their deep their reinforcement learning systems um, are going to be enough to get to kind of general intelligence. And what's what were your thoughts on that? Yeah, I love the point that you're making about the distinction between goal and reward. And th this is something that 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 I'm quite passionate about. Um, so there has been a conflation in the reinforcement learning literature for a long time between so-called model-based reinforcement learning and goal-directed behavior. And I wanna argue very briefly that that's been a interesting and productive and yet ultimately inappropriate conflation. Um, it, it, but I will say, I think there's a number of people in the literature who understand that well and are, and are, and are doing work to, um, to fix it. So model-based reinforcement learning as most often applied, certainly not universally, is forward rollout. So in chess, for instance, what one might do is say, well, if I do this and she does this and I do this and she does this, then this is where we'll be. I have some way of scoring that. But I'm not doing that rollout because I'm trying to achieve a state in the future that I defined ex ante. I mean, of course, I'm trying to get to checkmate. I mean, the whole system is designed to get to checkmate. But let's consider an intermediate level goal, like I'd like to capture the queen, or I'd like to control the center of the board, or I'd like to castle within three moves. The current methods are in no way explicitly holding in mind those sorts of mid-level goals, at least as far as I'm aware, and then selectively retrieving candidate plans conditional on that mid-level goal. Instead, what they're doing is they're just trying things out based on good heuristics, just bumbling forwards and saying, and if I did that sequence of things, then where would I be and how good would it be? That is not what human goal-directed planning is like at all. Generally speaking, when humans plan, you know, if we're thinking like, oh, it's the morning, what shall I have for breakfast? Or, or um, we don't go about this by thinking, well, suppose the first thing I did was to open the refrigerator, then what would I see? Okay, and suppose that I pulled out the milk, then what could I do with that? And then just kind of bumble our way into a bowl of cereal. Instead, what we do is we consider candidate goals. Well, shall I have cereal or muffins or you know, go out to the coffee shop today? And then once we've selected the candidate goal, then the particular ways of achieving that goal that come to mind are appropriately constrained and directed towards you know that goal so there's the options framework and rl gestures towards this way of doing things um and 
Yeah, I'll say Matt Botvinnik has been, I think, the leader in this area for 15 years, even though he hasn't been particularly active in it. <laughs> but he's written a number of really fantastic um, papers along the way. And so I have some optimism that over a deep mind, eventually they'll start you know, building computers that do things this way. But I think it's one of the most deep and interesting questions about human planning, why it is that we rely so heavily on this particular model-based strategy of establishing mid-level goals and then having constrained, consider sort of constrained sets of options, um, means is what I, you know, sort of plans of achieving those goals that come to mind. What are the computational efficiencies that come out of that? And 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 then what is the reason that just generally speaking, as far as I can tell, those haven't been the dominant model-based methods that have been applied in AI. Is it because there's low hanging fruit, or anyway, there's fruit hanging out there that someone should pick, and if we built the AI like that, they would actually do better? Or is it because of computational constraints on human reasoning that are different than the sort of computational constraints that actually apply to current AI systems? Um, so, uh, so I absolutely adore that question, and 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 thank you for asking it. And th this is an area I mentioned at the very beginning of this talk that my lab has a group of people who study morality and a group of people who study decision making. Among the decision making studiers, this is one of the things um, that that we're quite focused on. Um, the second question that you asked is, you know, is reward enough? And I, you know, I am not an expert on artificial intelligence. I, I'm the thing that I study and learn about is human psychology. It's perfectly obvious that the design of the human mind isn't a generic high level reward function followed by a whole lot of optimization in a domain general, you know, kind of unstructured way. It, it's like dead obvious that although there's elements of human psychology that perhaps look something like that, there's really important elements of human psychology that have tons of built in structure um, and uh, and have evolutionarily ancient roots and also culturally ancient roots. Um, and my interest is usually at the intersection of those trying to figure out um, how is it that we have this kind of general ability to pursue the things that make us happy in the world. And then we also have this cultural inheritance that we don't fully understand and a genetic inheritance that we don't fully understand. And then we're trying to allow good decisions to emerge from the interplay between those influences. Sorry, I want to bring come back to the core of what Melanie said, because I'm not sure if it got addressed with regards to your sort of use of the terms. I do think there is a difference. So it's interesting. I think culturally, some cultures rely more on kind of uh, rewarding, punishing each other implicitly to con control or reinforce each other's behaviors and some don't and some folks some cult some folks from some culture are also more immune to the kind of re the basic model free approach to being programmed so to speak i think what melanie said was um regards a little bit the application of simple uh, model free or model based rl to human morality in the sense that goal, decision means something different for humans than it might mean for an agent in a game or for a dog when you're training it. So Melanie, maybe you want to... Um... Yeah, I mean, th this occurred to me when you were talking about the, do the dog on the yard versus the pavement problem. And, you know, when you tell humans, um, okay, there's a goal, what are the rewards that will get you to the goal? They there's a sense of like, okay, the, we have to get to the goal. That's the thing to do. But if you phrase it a little differently, you know, if you said, you know, you're going to make money from getting reward points, they would do mm -hmm. something different. Um, and so it's, you know, the, the notion of a goal is a very complex concept in human, in the human mind. It can be. Uh, and uh, it's a very different concept from, you know, a reward. And, you know, it was interesting that the people kind of gave rewards that drew a map, which is what mm. makes sense. Um, and then the RL agent could find the loophole in that and maximize its reward. Uh, I don't know. I mean, the, these terms that people apply to their programs are, 
in this anthropomorphic way can be misleading. That, you know, we think, oh, AlphaGo has a goal, but it's really not the same thing at all as a human having a goal mm -hmm, mm -hmm, or, mm -hmm. you know, getting a reward or whatever. Does that, I mean, I don't know if that that's really essential, I think, in, in this whole kind of AI alignment with human values debate that people mm -hmm. are talking about that this, this idea that these that the, the terms that we use in our in everyday language have anything to do with what these programs are doing. Yeah, well, the point is very well taken. And I agree that um, a human being rewarded and punished, you know, in the way that I showed in that slide, um, I think would naturally slip into what what Dan Dennett calls the intentional stance. That is that they would recognize that these particular rewards and punishments are unlikely to be an accident of the environment and therefore a reward to be maximized, but are likely to have been constructed by some intelligent agent. And then as soon as they do that, as you say, the human, but not the AI, is going to have the expectation that that intelligent agent is trying to communicate and has presumably some type of goal. And they and they bring much more knowledge, like they know that they're in an experiment and the experiment was designed by an experimenter and, the, you know, and, and they know what flowers are and they know what paths are and they know what doors are. So, um, yeah, so the, I, I, the, the point is extremely well taken. Thank you. I'm going to jump in here. Ida, oh, sorry. Just one thing, Ida, just to follow up on what Melanie said, just one thing before we get to is, but you say that, but what, what Melanie's talking about is the danger of slipping into metaphor with these words, right? In other words, that, that they, the words are used and, and, and sometimes in the AI world, they get inflated into their human use to make it look like we've gotten further than we have. So in other words, would, you know, is this just harmless use of metaphor and everyone should be aware? that this is just a metaphorical use, and I agree entirely with Melanie that there's really a divide, or isn't it also true that the implication is that we just keep on at it on the RL side of the use of the word, that we'll get to the version that Melanie is talking about? So yeah. which one is it? I mean, it's the feeling that this is a slight case, not on your part, of yeah, course, yeah, yeah. of bad faith. Right. Yeah, I guess what I, you know, there, so, the, the dilemma that you're raising um, d does resonate very deeply. And there's a slightly different version of it that I face. So I have the sense that the way that you and Melanie, the perspective that, that you're, the, the concern that, that you come to the table with is about overclaiming on the part of AI. For my own part, I, you know, a AI is interesting, but it's not my core nine to five. I'm thinking about human psychology and there's a complementary danger, which I have to think a lot about. But it's kind of the opposite one. It's that we're dumbing down the humans. You know, there's not much that a human does that you can't fit Q learning to. I mean, just the dead simplest, you know, model free reinforcement learning strategy that you want. You'll get a fit, you know, it'll be better than chance. But obviously, what humans are doing is much, 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 much more complicated and interesting than that in many cases, right? And the this is the kind of danger and challenge that I alluded to at the very beginning when I said in my lab, we're trying to use these simple models of decision making that have empirical support. We know they're part of what the human brain does. And then we're trying to capture something as complicated and interesting as morality. For us, the I worry less, well, in the AI community, will people say, ah, we have goals, we have morality when they have less. My concern is, well, I say, ah, we understand goals. We understand morality in humans because, look, I fit this incredibly simple model and I captured the data better than chance, but I haven't even begun to capture, you know, the, the full richness uh, of, of what humans themselves are doing. And so that, that's just a constantly present danger. Here is the reason why, even though using computational methods, I think, invites that type of simplification it is ultimately the best strategy. So I grew up in graduate school, um, just doing, you know, at the time there, there was much less computational work that was being done in social psychology and, and in the corners of cognitive psychology that I operated in. The way that I studied morality was mostly by 
um, writing hypothetical vignettes, like, you know, the people who are drunk driving and they hit the tree versus the girl and soliciting people's judgments. And then we would describe our theories exclusively in plain English. And I loved it. And I think we learned a lot. I think the field made a great deal of progress. However, one thing that I found frustrating was just how much time we spent talking past each other, because we couldn't see eye to eye on our use of terms or the the language that we was were using um, wasn't adequate to describe the set of background assumptions that we were bringing to the table or the, the, the way that we were construing, you know, the underlying concepts. And then there'd be these, I mean, you know, the way academic debates are, there'd be these decades long debates that you were pretty sure just boiled down to people, you know, talking past each other. When I got to Brown, the there were a number, I was just very lucky to be seated across the hall from people who were doing reinforcement learning in the psychology department and to become friends with Michael Littman. And one of the first things that happened when I, I started to, to, to try to learn a little bit about the computational methods was that I noticed that people were at least able to quickly speak in a common language and diagnose, well, if your model got a different result than my model, why might that be? I mean, not always perfectly, but much more reliably than when everything was done in terms of plain English. And I guess it's my conviction that even if in the near term, we run the risk of overhyping AI and underhyping, as it were, you know, human abilities, the method of being able to ground our ideas in a common interpretable language, a language where different studies snap together like Legos, I can say, oh, you built that, I built this. Look, <laughs> if we use the same symbols, we can make them work together. Um, I mean, to me, that was so refreshing and transformational that even though I was years behind in learning this stuff and I'm not very good at math, I just felt like this is this is the way that I have to do at least some of my science. This is too much fun not to be part of. It felt like we were all climbing the same mountain. Sorry, I just want to say something about that, though. So I'm very with you. I do believe that math is the fantastic language. I feel like it's a part of my cultural heritage. Like, you know, there's it, it's everywhere in the architecture when you grow up in Iran, etc. Like, I absolutely fan of it. I also think, yeah, so so math has been used so since cybernetics in the early uh, early 20th century has been used to model human behavior and think of that. So I'm very with you about the um, relevance of that. I'm also very much with you that we can constrain the kinds of questions that we want to ask, whether it's about animals or humans, and then model that and model behavior in that constrained form and see if it can generalize and then kind of piece it together and then discuss uh, because sometimes four different um, uh, models can capture the same verbal theory. And once you actually put math to it, then it, you, you have to make commitments. You have to really make commitments about what you really mean by certain things. That being said, I do think that, and I've said this uh, last year on this uh, salon, there are different generations and traditions in RL even and in various forms of machine learning. And I think some of them are maybe... It's not similar to the kind of analytic continental debate in um, in philosophy, but it is uh, in it is such that some rely a lot more on representation and some rely a lot more on just simplification to a point where things are just tautologies, which is a little bit more my criticism of some of analytic philosophy's heritage. And uh, on the other hand, there are there were I think like I guess like the the Adorno of uh, machine learning would be the dynamical systems of the 90s that were so complex that it was not possible to kind of bring it together. Maybe 100 years from now, 50 years from now, they're going to come back. We don't know because neural networks fell out of fashion and came back. So, But um, that being said, which is the more embodied approach, which I think maybe in the future it's going to come back. We're not very good at embodied uh, machine learning right now. I feel like at least the cognitivist versus the behaviorist reinforcement learning are things that we can distinguish from each other and we can critically look at both of them. I think while I agree with you 100% that it really helps to have a common language that you can even code and see in a game of Atari, how they behave or a game that you design, which is like the experiments, um, there is a danger of inheriting the behaviorist um, philosophy that is inherent in simple uh, reinforcement learning of the early 20th century. 
that is inspired by conditioning. And as someone who's like very much a grandchild of the cognitive revolution, I feel like there is a kind of a more representation learning, a kind of a more careful, a kind of a more, um, you know, cautious approach to reinforcement learning that addresses complexity again with math and makes sure like does everything possible so people actually realize, okay, right now I am testing this particular condition. I'm showing you this model versus this model. Uh, differ on how they capture human behavior and this one wins over that. So very careful, controlled, and like, you know, um, and this one, ca while it captures the accuracy, doesn't capture the reaction times, etc. So smaller mm -hmm. claims, so to speak. Uh, yeah. But at the same time, smaller claims that, in my opinion, have like, why, you know, uh, in, I, that's what I've put my work on it. So I have, so I obviously believe in it that like it can have a lot of consequences for different ways of thinking about it. And I think maybe um, there could be three different levels of criticism. Uh, one level is no matter what you do, RL's terms are never gonna map to human terms. Another criticism, which I think is a critique that I would have is that the, we have to be careful about the dangers of the ghost of behaviorism slipping in through uh, reinforcement learning approaches. And uh, then there is the middle ground, which says we have to be careful to use enough either representation learning or, you know, uh, multi-area uh, uh, thinking in terms of the uh, brain or in terms of cognition and in terms of cognitive maps, et cetera, so that when we are saying something, at least we are not slipping into behaviorism and that it's constrained. But obviously, we can't claim that everything we are saying maps word one to one. So the criticism that says anything you do with representation learning, ML, AI will never capture, will hold for all of the, the work that we do. But I feel like, um, and I don't know where Melanie stands. I think Melanie might be on the more extreme side of the criticism. I think my critique is, however, that um, let's make sure whatever we do, we don't let behaviorism slip in. And that's my mm -hmm. worry about a training a dog example being a kind of a example in a human moral uh, discussion, right? So I'm a little bit, um, I guess you and I are a lot closer in the way that we think about things uh, philosophically and in the methods and in the usefulness of them. And my critique might be a lot milder than uh, Melanie's critique. So I think that there are interesting things that you can say, even with very simple models, if it's modeling the behavior, then fine. I personally know there's a lot of you know, behaviors that can definitely, my behaviors that can definitely capture by model free reinforcement learning that I cannot know, however. So here's the challenge. Somebody else can observe it and model it. I could look at myself in a third person and model it, but I can't explain that I'm making these moral decisions with, with model free RL, right? So it's a little yeah. complex, but I still can buy that. Uh, I just will be, it would be a, a little bit more challenging to me if it's slipping into too much behaviorism. Because yeah, if, yeah. if we have this kind of, there is this new work, narrative machine learning and things like that, where um, whether it is an, a word embedding with different frequencies or whether it's a kind of a, a representation of an environment that's skewed towards one direction or other, and I'm doing what I'm doing based on that, whether it's intrinsically motivated uh, exploration and behavior in the world, in these cases, we are not in the behaviorist domain because there's something between the ears that's processing things um, and representing things, uh, whether it's ideology, whether it's some beliefs or something that's impacting the behavior, which is not captured at all in model free. It's not captured mm -hmm. at all in the ways in which you can overcome model free and even accept all of the um, kind of challenges, for instance, like the women who you know, came forward at Harvard in spite of all of the punishment that they, all of the women over the years have faced for coming forward about uh, assault. I think that there are cases where humans uh, can get out of that kind of the uh, grid world other than the feedback loops. Um, I do wonder whether you would consider a milder version of Melanie's criticism with regards to the dangers of behaviors and which I don't think you as subscribe to at all. So I think probably that's not a danger, but I wanna hear what you think. And I'd love to hear afterwards, Melanie, yeah. what do you think of this version of the milder criticism? Shall I jump in briefly, Melanie, or do you wanna, uh, yeah? Okay, so uh, I really appreciate that point. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, I 
I do, and, and the lab does think very seriously about um, the, the limits of applying simple RL models. I, I think it might be helpful though to reflect on, the, you know, I know I haven't shown you an actual model, but I've kind of alluded to a model. And one of the things that I pointed out about it, which we find exciting is that it's marrying two traditions that are um, in conversation, but not often combined, RL and Bayesian inference. Up here in Cambridge, when we think about computational modeling of human behavior, everyone's first thought is Bayesian inference. And there's a tradition at MIT that really is emphasizing highly structured, rich representations and fantastically challenging computations over those representations that everybody agrees at the algorithmic level couldn't possibly describe what humans are doing, you know, at least not in the way that the machines are doing them, right? Um, and so on the one hand, you might say, oh, great. Well, he's making two mistakes at once in his research. <laughs> you know, half of his model is an oversimplification and half of his model uh, is grandiose. Um, and, and just to draw out the kind of grandiose aspect, I want to link this back to something that, that John brought up earlier, you know, when we were talking about non-human animals and um, what are the circumstances in which we're actually engaging in recursive mentalizing or which we're not. You know, I mentioned um, this work on the Rational Speech Act model. This is a Bayesian model of how we understand, among other things, figurative language, like, oh gosh, don't you love this weather today? Well. When I first drew that analogy, and this is really inspired by my student, Aruna Masarin, the two of us went to talk to a colleague of mine, Jesse Snedeker, who's done some work on pragmatics and language, and asked her, you know, what did she think of these ideas? And she said, well, you should just be aware that, well, I don't think anybody disputes that we can, we have the ability to interpret the statement, oh, don't you love this weather, by engaging in fourth order mentalizing. There's a lot of people out there, linguists, who think that by and large, just in everyday conversation, that's not what we're doing. Because notice that you typically wouldn't say, hey, don't you love this weather today? You'd say, oh, don't you love this weather today? And the tone that you're using is giving people a heuristic in that this is almost certainly an ironic statement. And that what they should do is an extremely simple computation in which they just flip its literal meaning rather than a very complicated Bayesian inference in which they have a prior expectation about your attitudes towards the weather and they're doing inference to the best explanation over the actual literal utterance that, you know, and so forth. So she said, just be aware. Again, it's not that people think that we're incapable of doing something approximating the Bayesian inference that RSA dictates, but there's a lot of folks who think that a lot of the time we're engaged in something much, much simpler than that. So anyway, to come back to this point, one interpretation is, okay, well, so the, in, in a single ill-founded research project, you know, fiery students have managed to combine both an oversimplification and something grandiose. Rather, what I take away from it is, again, this point that I made earlier, isn't it amazing that now in both of those domains, planning and decision-making and inference, we have models that are well-specified enough that we can actually start to knit them together and engage in the tug and pull of saying, what is the appropriate balancing point between simplicity and richness? Which is a debate that's a century old in the behavioral sciences. But if you dialed back the clock 50 or 100 years ago, I would argue that the key players in that, that debate were relatively less able to make the progress that I'm hopeful we'll be able to make because they, they lacked the formal tools that were gonna allow them to really specify all the points along the spectrum and you know whatever it is that's surely in between the two extremes that humans are actually doing sorry one minor comment i wasn't thinking about um bayesian notions of representationalism versus rl i was thinking about more behaviorist types of rl versus those that are representation rich or cognitive cognitively rich, cognitive map like rich. So I so I'll just ask again, like maybe like a thumb down up, like what, what is your perspective on behaviorism? I'm not a behaviorist. <laughs> Against. <laughs> but yeah. but but I will say, <laughs> like uh, um again in the in the intellectual environment that I grew up in graduate school at Harvard and, and down the road from MIT, I often I, I mean never in a million years have I questioned 
that humans use incredibly structured representations, you know, explicit theories, um, have causal generative models, and so on and so on and so on. Okay. And, and we can have that can take a Bayesian tint or that can take a kind of um, richer, more structured version of a solution to the RL problem like planning never questioning those things, have often found myself in the position of being the person or one of the people in the room who's just defending the idea that in addition to our ability to do all those things, we also have the ability to have very, very low level statistical solutions to problems that are computationally cheap and quick. Um, and I mean, obviously, like I say, people have been having this debate and saying these things for, for 100 or 120 years in the field. Um, so there's nothing new about that. Um, but I think it's it, it, it's it's fun to kind of do the mental simulation sometimes if you take your own set of commitments on that spectrum and then put yourself in different departments around the world and say, it, against the background of this department, where do I look on the spectrum? And then if I move over to this department over here, where do I look on that spectrum? You suddenly realize that maybe your own views and other people's views are much more nuanced and variable than it feels when you're burrowed in that same debate with that same person across the hall that you know that you've been in for five years. You're totally right, and I think another danger is uh, just like humans. At, sorry, this is New York City. As humans give explanations um, about their behavior that are actually don't ex that don't actually explain their behavior, or we sometimes think we have certain commitments, but actually. When you look at our behavior, it might be a little different. I think that's the reason I use the term the ghost of behaviorism slipping in. But I totally agree with you that, uh, and I, I also assumed that you're definitely not a behaviorist. That's why I can ask in the pile of this conversation. Sorry. So, Melanie, please, uh, to your comments on Javier, sorry to keep you so much waiting, but I know that you're you're very much in this conversation because I, I know what your comments you're going to make. But, Melanie, please go ahead. No, I, I mean, I don't have any long comments. I, I don't, you know, I love simple models. I'm, I'm, I'm here at Santa Fe Institute, the, in, the, the, the world center of simple models of complex systems, right? And um, I, but, you know, I just don't, I think we have to be very careful about our interpretation of them. And we, you know, the, I talk about in some of my writings, I talk about this term wishful mnemonics, which Drew McDermott, Yale, AI researcher uh, coined this term, which is when we give our models or our or describe our models in in these terms, like using human-like words like goal and reward and so on, and we overinterpret what these models are capturing because we're using these terms. And I, I think that's just something that we all have to struggle with in in our work as modelers. Um, and I, you know. So that's I just wanted to bring it up for that reason. But I'm I'm not I'm not opposed to simple models. I'm um, and I I also agree with Fiery about that that a lot of our behavior can be explained by you know these simpler you know statistical association kind of or simple policies what what have you, but not all of it clearly. Thanks. And I'll let Javier say, <laughs> ask his question. Yeah, thanks for this. This has been super cool. Uh, I definitely feel uneducated on the philosophical front, but um, yeah, the, the puppy experiment was really fascinating. And I mean, I think it's super important to sort of pressure test, like you did, um, the RL models and the in you know the 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 implicit sort of well the the fact that it seems like they stretch beyond what they really do by having a person draw the 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 reward map and seeing what happens with the AI. I think that's like a fascinating experiment. Um, and it got me thinking a little bit about, well, then later what John was saying about the definitions of words and you know the importance of defining the words clearly and all that. And that also relates with specifying your models mathematically because then you, you, you're, you're stuck. You, it, you know, it either works or it doesn't. But in terms of um, what the humans did in that experiment, which you described as trying to describe a map or a gradient of reward, um, that got me thinking. So if you ran this experiment with like regular TD learning, where there was only one reward site, which was the goal, and maybe you had negative rewards at the flowers, eventually the agent would learn the gradient, right? So yeah, what, right? So so it's like okay, so it's almost like so the humans are trying to teach 
ultimately the what the agent would get to at the end, right? Um, and so there are two points I want to make here. One is I think that I mean I'm definitely not an RL expert, but as far as I understand, like if you use sub goals and stuff like that, uh, or if you just use reward, but you give the goal a reward that's of a different magnitude um, than the sub goal rewards, then you will be able to replicate that with with what the humans did, right? But obviously you're pressure testing this, and I mean I understand the sort of a straw man critique of the experiment. But the question that I think is really interesting is why do people convey the map rather than the ultimate goal or whatever, right? And it has yeah. me thinking about this, um, well, I don't know, I'll let you answer that, but the thing that it really reminds me of, which is related to a lot of the stuff you were just talking about in the last few minutes about these apparent paradoxes is um, the idea of like bounded rationality and bounded optimality. You know, like we can yo-yo between very simple solutions and complicated solutions, but only when it's necessary. So I don't know, I don't know what your thoughts are on the fact that people are trying to communicate something to minimize computation time for other people. Yeah, um, this is a really terrific point. And if you stick with me for like 30 seconds, I'm gonna pull up a graphic from the original paper that I think is gonna speak to it um, in a useful way. I need to learn a card trick for these kinds of 30 second intermissions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, no, it, it won't even be 30, 30 seconds. So here we go. Uh, share screen. Great discussion, by the way. I've been really enjoying this discussion. Very thoughtful. Oh, man. I'm having so much fun. Um, nope, that's not the graphic I want. OK, cool. Yeah, this is the graphic I want. Can folks see that? Someone give me a shout out because I can't see you. I can anymore. see it and I'm trying to focus it, but it's kind of like on the, you know, it's it's showing it's like on one the blurry of the speakers, side. But that's okay. You know, they, all right, all right. It, it works. It works perfectly. It works okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I just I just want to show um the, the thing that it is that Javier is saying to make sure that everyone's following it because it's a really great point. Um so what Javier said is in this grid right here. Here is an example of the rewards that you could use that the reinforcement learning agent, the, the AI, you know, the one that plays chess and go and stuff would nail. It would do a great job with this one and it wouldn't make those funny little loops. And um, the reason that it wouldn't is because there are no loops. I mean, the only way to get reward is to move on to the goal position. And if you wanna get there without incurring any costs, you better go on the path, right? But the problem with this map is that it precisely doesn't leave a trail of breadcrumbs. So the human would be constructing a reward that the AI system could use, or the dog could use, or another human could use, to eventually learn the reward, but no faster than if the environment itself had just provisioned a reward at, at the goal state. Now, I want you to think about that in relation to the sorts of things that we're usually trying to teach each other, especially in collaborative settings. So like as a parent, when I teach my children how to bake a cake, okay, I'm trying to teach them something which, if they accomplish it, is going to be rewarding to them. And so for me to say, oh, well, I've got a solution that doesn't involve any, you know, these nasty feedback loops, I'll just wait until my child stumbles into making a cake accidentally and then reward it. First of all, it's not really helping my child because the whole problem is how do you stumble there in the first place? And second of all, it's actually redundant because if they baked a cake, they'd know it was good. I mean, they'd be perfectly happy. They wouldn't need me rewarding them. So then the challenge is, well, how is a human gonna simplify the learning process for uh, apprentices? You know, and, and then it turns out that if you try to simplify that process for apprentices in a way that doesn't generate these positive feedback loops, it's super complicated. Now there's a literature on it in the 1960s in psychology, because this is what behaviors were trying to do when they were teaching complex skills to animals um, was to construct shaping strategies. So gradually leaving that trail of breadcrumbs and they would generally do it in ways where they were sort of adding and rewarding rewards to scaffolds that the that, that organism couldn't backtrack, okay? But it's interesting that as a parent, one often doesn't have to do that for one's children, okay? And maybe again, this comes back to distinctive skills that we have as humans in interpreting the communicative intentions of someone rewarding and punishing or otherwise 
demonstrating or, or facilitating our learning. But there's a second literature in which this has been done, and that's actually the RL literature. Computer scientists have been able to define algorithms to derive optimal shaping strategies for reward maximizers that do leave an appropriate trail of breadcrumbs and a little gradient that you can climb, but in a way that doesn't lead to the positive feedback loops. It just turns out it's really hard. That is a hard problem to solve. Whereas a much, much computationally easier problem to solve is I'm going to give you a reward for every action that's in the optimal policy, and I'm going to give you a punishment for every action that's not in the optimal policy. And then if you just follow my simple instructions, which I've laid out for you quite clearly, you're going to end up with the optimal policy very fast. It's just that in order for that strategy to work, the teacher and learner need to be coordinated on the idea that what they're doing is not shaping for a reward maximizing learner but instead using reward and punishment as a kind of representational setting, communicative setting, to efficiently convey the structure of the optimal policy. I know so at the because, end there, I kind of, well, I, I, I slipped into relatively more technical language than I've been trying to use uh, before. So feel free to ask questions like what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, this is a, a uh, some debate is safe here and is sort of philosophical. So I, I, it's not that I, I don't agree with you and I don't find your points compelling, but um, I think there's a big jump you're making from the first sort of breadcrumb argument um, to just having this mentalizing explanation for it. I don't know if that's explicitly necessary um, because, for example, you can have an agent in a vacuum um, that is following a trail of breadcrumbs. And I mean, I really like what you said about how to convey information in the absence of experience. Like you've never baked a cake, so how would you know, how would you know to move towards a cake, right? Um, so, you know, you can, I, I feel like you don't need to have a model of your teacher necessarily if, for example, and I think somebody mentioned this in the chat too. There is there is a cost to your actions, which again, this this goes back to the whole idea of cognitive control and reward rate and all this kind of stuff. Like it's not just reward, but it's like reward over time, and the fact that time is sort of the ultimate limiting factor in our behavior. Um, so I don't know. I, I mean, this is I, this is highly unspecified what I'm saying, but maybe maybe could you try to defend why you think that the mentalizing is really necessary um, to explain this type of yeah. behavior? Thanks. Okay, great. That's a terrific question. Um, so the answer is in that paper, the dog paper, mentalizing is not necessary. And in fact, the paper presents much simpler algorithms that don't involve any mentalizing. And where the algorithm is just we stipulate that what the teacher is going to do is reward everything in the optimal policy and punish otherwise. And what the learner is going to do is interpret the reward and punishment as such. So it's, I mean, that's a very ad hoc model, obviously, you know, um, but it doesn't involve any mentalizing and it definitely solves the problem. Right. So the argument that I gave, which is a weak argument in a, in a circumstantial, uh, you know, evidence, but in, in the opening, is that if we then think about something like figurative punishment where the gift is left on the pillow but it actually is interpreted as a punishment that it would be hard to understand how that is interpreted without mentalizing now i mean of course again one could come up with some type of ad hoc model such as when your roommates leave dish soap <laughs> you know you could have like an absurdly ad hoc model that would just say oh well when that happens you know it's a punishment right um, so it's not that there doesn't exist a model that could do otherwise, but it seems like the most parsimonious approach would probably involve mentalizing. Right now, we're trying to build an experimental paradigm and a set of act, you know, fully specified models that look more like the dog training experiment, where it's easy to quantify what's happening and we can, um, as opposed to something more vignette-based, you know, as, as the experiments uh, with the roommates are. Um, to be determined whether those will succeed and whether whether they'll support the, the hypothesis that I sketched out. Let me just also say, you mentioned this thing, which has in all these years never occurred to me and kudos to whoever put it in the chat. I don't have my chat open because I wouldn't be able to 
monitor it and, and talk at the same time and listen appropriately. But um, but you said somebody in the chat pointed out that if you uh, introduced a sufficiently high um, time step cost, that uh, that presumably the way that humans are punishing and rewarding the RL agent would actually solve. I think that's right. I don't know. I mean, you know, I'd have to try it out, but intuitively that seems exactly right to me. That's a really cool point. We should have considered it and we didn't. And thank you to whoever put that in the chat. I think that is uh, directly related to one of the questions in the chat. So I'm just gonna read that question to you. Uh, since we only have about 20 minutes, I think I'm gonna, please stay on screen by the way, both Melanie and Javier, you can definitely participate. And if anybody who has asked a question would like to appear on screen, please write your name in the chat or say something in the chat because most people said they don't wanna appear on screen. So I'm just assuming. Mihai, I think maybe you might be one of the people who usually joins us. So if you wanna join, let me know. Um, so uh, one of the questions was from Amir and he says, looks like there should be a separation between reward and punishment and expectation of reward and punishment. For example, the puppy situation can be better understood by noting that the only actual reward is getting to home. All the other states are expectation of reward. Also punishment is quite useless because the person has already received the punishment and doesn't have incentive to change behavior. I'm a little, okay, I think I mis misread it when I was reading fast. Um, morality works because of the expectation or exception. Um, okay, just moved up. I think they mean expectation, expectation. expectation yeah. Yeah. rather than punishment itself. So uh, the reason I mentioned this in addition to what Javier was saying is because it, uh, in order to expect something, you need to have had a temporal encounter with it over time, so to speak. And so it needs to be a multi-step thing so that you can expect something later on. Um, so it's tangentially related. So what do you think of this question? I'm not sure I entirely understand some parts of it, but I think I get the gist of it. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I get the gist of it too, and I love it. Um, and it's, it's, it's very connected to um, some ideas that uh, Mark and I worked on a number of years back. And at the beginning of this, uh, Ida had asked me to have a slide ready in which I provide some links to papers. And so I've just added um, that uh, the, the title of that paper to this slide. And what I'm gonna do is share it with you all so that if people are interested to follow up, they can. And obviously I'll explain how it is that this actually um, relates to what I think is a pretty deep and interesting question. So there's the slide. Up here, you can see um, the, uh, um, URL of my lab's website. This is uh, what my lab looks like. Hopefully we'll all be back in person again soon. We're kind of trickling in. Um, and then this is just a collection of papers over here um, that are uh, relevant to some of the themes that I've been talking about today. And this it's this paper right at the top here, Social is Special, which I think relates to the question. So the, the gist of the question was, look, um, what we need to teach with reward and punishment isn't which things are actually good or bad in the world, we're trying to teach appropriate expectations about which things will eventually get rewarded and punished. And um, I think that's exactly right. And I, th I think that's a very deep point. Um, I would connect that back to this point that I was making earlier about how if I'm teaching my daughters to bake a cake, for instance, I don't want to teach them, oh, you know what's good? Having cake. I want to teach them, you know what's good? All the actions which one can reliably expect to produce a cake if performed in the appropriate sequence. In the language of reinforcement learning, we could describe that set of actions as a policy. That's one way we could describe it. Policy just means the set of actions that you do, that you tend to do in a certain environment. But another word that we can use to describe it is the value function. So in reinforcement learning, what you're trying to learn is the value of things that lead to reward. And what value means in this context is exactly an expectation. The value of something is the expectation of its future rewards given, and this is critical, all the other choices that you're likely to eventually make. So for instance, you know, for a chess master, a particular opening move might have very high value because they know what to do next. For me, it might have very low value because I have no idea what to do next, right? For my daughters, cracking an egg 
has very low value right now, but if I could teach them to make a cake, it would be the sort of thing that had high value. And what I'm trying to give them is a value function that says, hey, if you're in the kitchen and your goal is cake, here's a whole sequence of actions that all have value. And if you perform them one after another, you'll get to the place that you want to be. Now, what I want to do is uh, inspired by, by um, the question, and I apologize, uh, I, I didn't catch the name of uh, the person who asked it. Um, oh, were you going to jump in, Ada? Oh, it was Amir. I just was going to say that. Amir, thanks. OK. Um, so Amir, inspired by your question, uh, what if instead of thinking about a cake, we thought about um, forming close and ultimately valuable social bonds with the people around us? You know, having colleagues that respect and support us, having um, a, a spouse who loves and supports us, um, things that are important, you know, for, for us to, to sort of succeed, as it were, in the world. You can think of it in a Darwinian sense if you want to. It is hard to learn those things. You know, it's not sometimes obvious. We, we have naive expectations about what we can do that would impress somebody, but those expectations are sometimes quite misguided and, and would have um, entirely the opposite effect. And our parents and our peers and our teachers are trying to help us to understand you might not think that you'd want to crack an egg in this case, but cracking an egg is just the thing you need to do to really get along with this person in the long run and to have them respect and value you and support you. So it's that same learning problem. There's a value function, but here they're moral values. They're the, they're the ways of acting around other people that have very important long run benefits but which it would be catastrophic to learn purely by trial and error because you would probably make gross errors. And with many of these things, like for instance, having a relationship with your spouse, you're not gonna get very many trials, you know, keeping a friend. I mean, if you lose them, you could lose them for good. And so just as you say, Amir, the challenge that we face is to teach morals which are in some sense, even if we don't explicitly represent them this way, their, their value in the reinforcement learning sense, they are things that are instrumentally useful for building relationships. Again, we, we don't think of them instrumentally, but from an evolutionary standpoint, that's exactly what they are. And we don't want people to have to learn by, by trial and error, by experiencing their failures, so we're gonna use reward and punishment to say, these are the actions that are socially expected, that are acceptable. And these are ones which have expectation of eventually giving you the relationships you need. So that's very, very in keeping with the way that I think about why, why if I'm somebody who ultimately cares about understanding human morality, would I bother spending so much time thinking about how you teach a child to bake a cake or how you teach a dog to walk on a path, um, which are not things, um, that are really morally laden at all. I think this might be a good time for me to ask a um, question that was posted by Dean. Dean Rance asks, if rewards and punishments have com uh, communicative rules, does that mean that in some way, rewards and punishments are also adjusted to have high entropy? Oh, you know what? I had never thought about it in exactly those terms, but um, Arunima, my student, has been making this point for some time. Uh, she has observed that when you're first teaching somebody, um, uh, for instance, how to behave, you might, so uh, suppose there's a child and you're trying to teach them good table manners, for instance, okay? So uh, for instance, not to interrupt, this is a challenge we currently face with our five and seven year old at the table. Um, so right now we're in the phase where we tend not to get too upset with them if they do interrupt, but we praise them effusively if they say, excuse me. But then as they get older, Arunima observed, what we're gonna be likely to do is to start to change our strategy so that we're gonna be less effusive in our praise every time they say, excuse me, and we'll be a little bit more snippy if they interrupt. And now I have, I'm, I'm not great with information theory, but I wonder whether a measure like entropy might be a useful way of thinking about um, why it is that it's useful to start with the rare behavior rewarding it, and then later move to the rare behavior, the rare negative behavior and punishing it. I, I wonder, again, I, I can't promise you that that's gonna be connected with entropy per se, 
but I wonder if that's not the style of um, idea that you had had in mind. Would that mean that you're equating prediction error with entropy and you're making sure that the magnitude of the prediction error is maintained such that they don't just get adjust accustomed to... So if you tell them once and you tell them the second time, the prediction error is going to be smaller. But yeah. if they haven't adjusted their behavior, if the learning rate doesn't seem to be high enough, you might be adjusting, as, the, as, um, as Dean was saying, you might be adjusting your response so that the prediction error would be higher so that the with the low learning rate that they have, they might learn. So there's mm. two, so two ways if, if they're not learning is uh, one is to repeat it very often and another one is to increase the magnitude of the prediction error. Repeating often might mm. have the uh, challenge that they mm. might get, um, what's the word? They might get accustomed to it. So it might not habituated. have- Habituated, that's the word. And so um, the prediction error wouldn't work anymore. Oh, hi, Mihai, you made it. And- uh, Well, your, your answer, I, I'd like to, um... I don't, am I allowed to just use your answer? My answer is her answer. <laughs> I think the, the truth is, I, I, the more I think about the answer I gave, the less I like it. So I'd like to strike that one from the record, but Ida sounded pretty good. Uh, Ida, I have to take off, but uh, thanks, thanks, Fiery. This has been great. I really uh, enjoyed the discussion. Oh, thank, thank you, you so funny. much. You know, I hate to say it, but my, my that very five and seven year old are probably sitting down at the dinner table right now and waiting to interrupt me. Um, so I should probably sign off too, but this has been so much fun. And over the last two years, as everyone's locked up and alone, um, this is exactly the kind of thing that I've been missing and what I love about um, being in this business. And thank you so much for uh, inviting me here and, and for making this opportunity available. Completely our pleasure. And you should definitely feel free to join the other times. Melanie was a speaker and there are many of our speakers join again. And the discussion is just always fantastic. So we hope that you're going to join us. Mihai, I'm sorry with the technical difficulty. It got a little late. I apologize. All right. Thank you, Fire. Thank you, Fire. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very interesting. Have a great, Take have care. A great weekend, everyone. Bye. Bye.